pleasure to introduce our colloquial speaker for today, Dr. Uh, uh, Scott Kruger from Los Alamos National Lab. Dr. Kruger is um, a, a research scientist there. She, she also has the highest di distinction being a fellow of the lab. He also got many, many other research awards. He's probably one of the most prolific and versatile and accomplished experimental condensed matter physicists that I know. He could easily probably give 10 talks, all on different topics, only on his most recent results. And it would be all amusing, profound, and uh, you know, unusual. So this is just one that it, examples of, example of those uh, things. And without further ado, oh, wait a minute. We also have a tiny gift which is engraved uh, laser point so that you will never forget visiting Texas A&M, okay, you see? Now let me put this... Um, there is a, anybody in the audience cannot tell me why this laser pointer is different? Okay, I'll use this one. No, I have to use this one. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah, so yeah. Is the sound working? Yeah, okay. Okay, Zoom people can start shouting now if there's a problem. Okay, deafening silent. All right, okay, thank you, uh, Alexei, for the very nice. In introduction. Thank you all for coming here uh, uh, this afternoon. I've been to uh, College Station and your beautiful campus just once before, about a dozen years ago, and it's, it's really nice to be back and chat with all the folks here in, in the physics department, learn a lot about quantum optics. Uh, as Alexei mentioned, I'm coming here from that small part of the National High Magnetic Field Lab. It's actually located uh, one state over up in the high mountains of northern New Mexico uh, at Los Alamos National Lab. And in our optical spectroscopy laboratory, we do spend most of our time actually studying materials and doing spectroscopy under condition, you know, extreme conditions of very, very high magnetic fields. But we've also, for the last 15 years, uh, been very interested in and have spent some time working at the other extreme, which is where everything's in thermal equilibrium. And we try to tease out the physics by, you know, often very interesting physics, just by listening, if you like, to intrinsic fluctuations of the system while in strict thermal equilibrium. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I think it's kind of a fun subject. I hope you'll agree. So the title of this talk is Listening to Spin and Magnetization Fluctuations, uh, uh, or What Can We Learn About uh, Magnetization Dynamics and Phase Transitions, but Without Ever Perturbing the System from Thermal Equilibrium. Okay. And just you know, before I get started, uh, I had just a quick show of hands. This is actually, this, this is a generational divide. I see a lot of young faces. Uh, uh, I also see faces that are closer to, to, to my age. So how many of you can remember as a kid turning on the TV and seeing that? Anybody? Really? Okay. Um, this is television static. This is what TVs used to do when you turn them on and there was no signal. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's just white noise. And the main theme of the talk will be uh, often, you know, more often than you might think, there's a lot of physics encoded in noise signals. Uh, in this case, this is just coming uh, from thermal noise of the amplifier that sits right after this uh, uh, antenna. Uh, don't worry, this talk will not be about television noise, uh, but it will rather be about ma magnetic systems. Um, and, and well, back to this generational question. I have two daughters, they're both teenagers. They've never seen this, ever. Until recently, one of them is now in college and is uh, you know, living in this noisy dormitory having trouble sleeping and then she's very excited she showed me she found this youtube video of uh television static noise which says this is great dad uh you know, two things that are remarkable one is it's 10 hours long and it's got you know over two million hits okay so somebody's paying attention and uh and she says dad you know did did televisions really used to do this and he said yeah honey they, they really did and she said and did you really watch it for 10 hours <laughs> so, well, no, it's the first time we were doing important things like watching Gilligan's Island for 10 hours. Anyway, um, here's a short outline of the talk. Uh, the big physics goal here, and really the, the takeaway message, is uh, we want to measure intrinsic fluctuations of 
magnetization and spin in conditions of strict thermal equilibrium. And via the fluctuation dissipation theorem, the noise and the noise alone uh, can often reveal the dynamics and underlying physics. So I'll spend uh, some time talking about the backgrounds of these types of techniques. Like most interesting things in condensed matter physics have started with nuclear magnetic resonance studies. The technique that we and others used is based on optics, uh, optical to noise spectroscopy, based on Faraday rotation. And give just a bit of the history. Uh, started with alkali atoms, semiconductors, ferromagnetic systems. I probably won't say too much about correlations because what I really want to share with you uh, is some very recent work about um, uh, noise of magnetic monopoles, so monopole like quasi particles that can exist in certain artificial ferromagnetic structures. Okay, so I think this is kind of a fun uh, topic. So, a noise spectroscopy, what do I mean? By this, what, what, what is it? And there's a very simple mechanical example. In fact, I'm a little embarrassed. This is you know, so mind-numbingly simple uh, 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 to share with this audience. But nonetheless, I think it does get kind of the main point across in a in, in a very straightforward way. So you know, consider the simplest mechanical system you can think of, just just a cantilever. And you know, let's say you're a, a grad student. Your advisor says, "Hey, I've got this new interesting system." I want you to learn about it and tell me what its dynamical properties are. Okay, so what's the resonant frequency of my mechanical system and what's its ring down time? How would you do that as, as a grad student? And of course, the obvious answer is, well, you could jump on it or hit it with a hammer, something. In other words, perturb it from equilibrium and then measure probably just with a stopwatch its oscillation and, and, and its ring down time. And in that way, you would have learned, of course, the resonant frequency and its Q factor or its ring down time. No? Uh, what I want to argue is there's an alternative method to doing this, which is if you could, and you had a very sensitive displacement ohmmeter or something, you could uh, just listen very carefully to the intrinsic thermal fluctuations of the system while it's in equilibrium. Okay, so it's not at zero temperature. There's KT worth of energy running around in the normal modes of the system. And if you can measure these tiny displacements as a function of time, then you can measure this correlator which is just a fancy way of saying, measure the spectrum of this noise signal. And what you'd find is this, is, is this noise signal would have peaks at the resonant frequency. And those peaks would have widths that correspond to the ring down time or one over the ring down time. So in other words, you've learned exactly this, the same information, but you didn't have to kick it or jump on it or something like that. Okay? So the, In this case, the external field would just be thermal fluctuation, temperature. Yeah, was there a quick question? The devices which I will show and haven't shown yet because we're not studying these, uh, uh, it's, it's gonna be primarily thermal fluctuation. Why don't we uh, get to that part of the talk, and then if the question is still, yeah, yeah. So again, this is in accord with the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It says spectrum of fluctuations and equilibrium describes the driven response. Now you'd be crazy to do that with something as macroscopic as a you know the diving board at your local swimming pool, of course. But you know what if your resonator was uh, mesoscopic, this nanometer scale? So this is just a picture from a real experiment from a friend of mine, Keith Schwab. Uh, this is a doubly clamped resonator. Very, very tiny. He's got a very sensitive way of measuring displacements with a single electron transistor. And here's how he measures the dynamical properties just by listening to the fluctuations of this thing. Um, and peaks tell you the resonant frequency and the widths tell you the ring down time. So the a, a message, a theme that we'll be returning to in this talk is that noise signatures actually become an increasing fraction of say the driven signal when things get really tiny. So sometimes you really win measuring uh, uh, small signals, small systems by looking at noise signatures. So what I want to talk about is spin and magnetization fluctuations. And so the magnetic analogy to this mechanical simple example is not you know, mechanical noise, but now magnetic fluctuations or spin noise. So normally if we want to measure spin dynamics, those are revealed with some sort of spin resonance type of experiment like nuclear magnetic resonance or electron spin resonance, or maybe some pump probe optics. 
And all of these methods are necessarily perturbative. I don't mean that in any disparaging way. That's just a statement of fact that you know, we have a system. You typically start with your box of spins or your material, whatever it is. Uh, shoot, I'm pressing the wrong button here. All right, one more. And uh, starts in thermal equilibrium. And then we perturb the system away from thermal equilibrium, either with a you know, high over two pulse if it's NMR, or maybe we you know, hit it with light if it's a pump probe optic experiment. We perturb it from equilibrium and then we measure its dissipative response back towards thermal equilibrium, okay? So if this was an NMR measurement, we'd be measuring a free induction decay as a function of time and the frequencies. And this uh, envelope here would tell you uh, the dynamical properties, gyromagnetic ratios, decoherence, decoherence, decoherence phase and time, so on and so forth. Okay. See how we normally do measurements. What I want to argue is that that same information is also available uh, just by listening to the intrinsic thermal, for example, or maybe if we're lucky, quantum fluctuations of the spins while in thermal equilibrium, while, while, while in equilibrium. Okay, so here, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at PowerPoint. So this jiggling you see is my attempt to represent the fact that you know, you know, these spins are fluctuating. If you just consider a box containing say N spins in equilibrium, and we want to say, you know, your advisor says, okay, you know, what is the net magnetization along this Z direction, All right? And, well, in thermal equilibrium, almost by definition, this net spin projection is going to be zero. Right. But, you know, at some instant in time, maybe 51% of them have projection this way and 49 have projection this way. At some later point in time, the converse might be true. So the point is this moment actually fluctuates in time. Fluctuations exist. If I have a box of N spins, these fluctuations have RMS amplitude of something like square root of N. Okay. If we can measure this in, in, in time, we can, again, compute the correlation function, which it's just a fancy way of saying what's the spectrum of this noise signal. And you would find that this noise signal has peaks and, uh, and, and, and those peaks would tell you something about gyromagnetic ratios and defactors and the widths of these peaks would tell you something about decoherence and dephasing. And the line shapes of these peaks would tell you something about the mechanism and was it exponential relaxation or power law or something else. And this will not surprise any of you who Remember the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which says in words that the linear response of the system to an external perturbation can also be described by the fluctuation properties while in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so that's sort of the main point here. So the spin noise alone, if you can measure it, describes the uh, dynamics, at least within linear response. Okay, and this is not a new idea at all. Okay, so in fact, back in 1946, uh, uh, Felix Bloch, in his famous paper where he Eventually introduced NMR. Uh, on page two of this paper is, is the following. Even in the absence of any orientation by an external field, one can expect in a sample with N nuclei to find a resulting moment on the order of square root of N. That's this statistical fluctuation or the noise uh, because of incomplete statistical cancellation. This moment, however, would naturally be very small. Of course, he's correct. Uh, that, you know, he's thinking about macroscopic samples of 10 to the 23rd spins. So the fluctuation part will be down by 11 or 12 orders of magnitude. Nonetheless, uh, 39 years later at Berkeley, a uh, very important, in my opinion, experiment was done uh, by Erwin Hahn and John Clark in their NMR laboratory, where they measured this nuclear spin noise signal. So there's a sample of, of stuff, NACL03, and it's in the pickup loop of uh, LC circuit that is flux coupled to a very sensitive squid magnetometer. Okay. And here's the output of their experiment. This is the response of their tuned circuit. And if you look very carefully right here, at this particular frequency, there's a tiny little bit of extra noise appearing in this experiment. Okay. It shows up a little better if we subtract off this response. This tiny bit of extra noise is coming just from the jiggling, the thermal, in this case, jiggling of these nuclear spins in thermal equilibrium. So no pi pulses, no RF fields, anything like that. But the first demonstration that noise signatures can actually be measured. And this has come a long way. Uh, so this is one of my favorite uh, papers. This is from the middle 2000s. 
uh, showing that uh, uh, Mueller and Gershaw showed that you can actually perform magnetic resonance imaging or MRI imaging just by listening to protons fluctuating around. Okay, so uh, these are, uh, they, they did MRI of basically water and not water and reconstruct um, of their sample just from the proton spin noise alone. Okay, so they write, this affords an entirely non-invasive visualization, uh, blah, 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 Rate, uh, tomography becomes possible when neither x-rays nor radio frequency can be applied for technical or safety reasons. Okay, and this uh, uh, method has been used more recently, uh, one of my favorite examples is from the group of Dan Rugar here, where uh, using a very sensitive cantilever magnetometer, they actually did MRI of a single tobacco mosaic virus. So a truly mesoscale object. And the method that they used was not to try to polarize the spins of the field, but rather just listening, so to speak, to the intrinsic fluctuations of the nuclei in that virus. Okay. So, uh, but they, they say something here very useful, which is you know, using the statistical polarization is advantageous because its RMS amplitude actually exceeds the mean Boltzmann polarization for nanoscale volumes of spins. This is an important point. What does that mean? Uh, if essentially it means that you win by measuring noise signal in comparison to the signal you would otherwise try to achieve by trying to you know, polarize spins. If, the number of uh, spins you're looking at is very small. So for nuclear spins or for typical magnetic fields, that crossover is something like a million spins. The signals you get just from fluctuations are going to be bigger, right? And there's many ways to measure magnetization. NMR, squid measurements, uh, NV centers, uh, for example. In our lab and in many labs around the world, uh, we do that with light. And uh, in, in particular, we take advantage of magneto optics and we measure magnetization using uh, uh, Faraday rotation. So again, just to remind, Faraday rotation is a phenomenon where we have linearly polarized light. And if you pass it through or bounce it off of some magnetized material, that linear polarization will rotate. And you can measure that with really tremendous sensitivity as, as I'll show. And this arises due to the difference of uh, left and right circularly polarized indices of refraction in the material. And that difference arises um, uh, in most magnetic materials. If you recall that linearly polarized light is just some superposition of right and left circular, presence of some time reversal symmetry breaking like magnetization introduces a phase shift that just corresponds to rotation. So this is the method we're gonna use to transduce magnetization in our laboratory and in many other laboratories around the world. So uh, the ability to play these games with polarized light and measure or infer magnetization um, is possible when you're, the system you're studying has circularly polarized optical selection rules. Okay, what does that mean? That means that right and left circularly polarized light couple preferentially and differently to spin up and spin down. Okay? These rules uh, emerge typically in systems with spin orbit coupling. This turns out to be almost everything. So most atomic systems, in particular alkali atoms, uh, many semiconductors like gallium arsenide, all ferromagnets, for, for example. So just in order to, to, to give an example of how this works, consider your favorite uh, alkali atom, so your favorite atom from the leftmost column of, of the periodic table, you know, sodium or potassium or, or, or rubidium. These are very simple. They have filled shells, and then there's one last electron that sits in the outermost S shell. Yeah. There are transitions to the, so in this case, I've taken rubidium. So the last electron is in the 5S shell. There are optical transitions to the P shells. And these are nice wavelengths in the infrared. Uh, but there's spin orbit coupling. And what that spin orbit coupling does at the end of the day is that uh, if you take your light and you tune it to one of these transitions, then if this electron has its spin up, it will couple to right circularly polarized light. If it's spin down, it will couple to left circularly polarized light. Okay. So what that means is that if now if I got a box of these atoms, and if the number of atoms that have their spin up is not equal to the number of atoms that have spin down, then the absorption of right and left circularly polarized light will be a little bit different. Okay. Well, if the absorption is a little bit different, then that means that the associated 
indices of refraction will also be a little bit different. Again, just to remind you, the index of refraction is the real part or the dispersive part of a dielectric function, whereas the absorption is the imaginary part of a dielectric function. They're intimately and always coupled. Well, this is fantastic news for Faraday rotation because that means we can take our laser, tune it way out here. Sorry, I forgot to mention one important piece, which is that these dispersive parts decay away much more slowly, typically as detuning in comparison with the absorbing part, which decays as detuning squared. So we can take a light and tune it way out here and still be sensitive to a magnetization via its influence on the indices of refraction, but be far away from this absorption piece. So we can interrogate the system without, at least the first order, perturbing it by creating real absorption. So in this sense, in this regard, this is a non-perturbing, oh, I had my email open to open the Zoom link, so I'm getting emails, sorry about that. Um, in this regard, it is a non-perturbing probe, or can be considered a non-perturbing probe that you could use for, you know, say, quantum non-demolition or a weak I'm going to do a very uh, not so subtle sleight of hand here. Uh, this is the diagram for an alkali atom. This is the relevant diagram for a semiconductor, and I want to just argue that they're basically the same diagram. It's just in a semiconductor, spin orbit coupling occurs in, in, in the uh, uh, occupied states in, 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 in valence band. But at the end of the day, most semiconductors also have these strictly polarized selection rules where I can couple the spin up or spin down just using left or right strictly polarized light. Okay. So the very first demonstration of detection of electronic spin noise probed optically was done uh, in 1981 by Alexandrov and Zapaski and in Russia or Soviet Union. Uh, and they were looking at sodium vapor in a small optical cell room temperature. And they observed an extra bit of noise in the Faraday rotation from spins fluctuating in the sodium vapor. Okay. So our own group's interest started about, I don't know, a dozen years, 15 years or so ago, uh, uh, motivated by this work from Alexandrov and Zapaski. Uh, and in uh, discussion with two uh, really amazing theorists who were working at Los Alamos at the time, which was uh, Sasha Bolotsky and Daryl Smith. And we wanted to see whether this could be turned into a real spectroscopy. Okay. So our very first experiment was incredibly simple. Uh, just took up about this much space on the optical table. Uh, we started with warm atomic vapors of alkali atoms. Again, a very well understood classical ensemble of N uncorrelated uh, spins. And uh, so we have mostly using rubidium vapor in thermal equilibrium, temperature just above room temperature. Average magnetization was always zero. Right? There's no pumping or perturbation. We took a laser, we tuned it near to, but not on one of these resonances. So there's no absorption or optical pumping. We're not disturbing or perturbing the system. Uh, nonetheless, random spin fluctuations in this vapor generated fluctuations in the Faraday rotation of a laser that was being passed through this. We can measure that with high sensitivity and we measure the power spectrum. I wanna emphasize that in these experiments, the ensemble is always in thermal equilibrium. And this is in contrast with conventional magnetic resonance where you kick the system away from equilibrium. Okay. So here's, oh, there's one last uh, little technical uh, game or trick we had to play. We had to apply a small transverse magnetic field, just a few gauss. And that was to force any spin fluctuation along Z to now process about the field. All that did was move the noise signal away from zero frequency out to megahertz, uh, where in general, things are much quieter in the laboratory. So uh, this is our first piece of data. This has uh, not been adulterated in any way. This is just the output from the spectrum analyzer. You know, volts per root hertz on the Y axis, frequency on the X axis. We're measuring, um, in this case, warm rubidium gas. We tune the laser near to, but not on one of these transitions and just listen for a while, an hour or so. And uh, after a lot of signal averaging, what we saw was the following. So there's some large background. Again, zero, this is 200, zero is way down below the floor there. There's a large background due to photon shot noise, which I'll discuss more, whoops. Uh, but then in addition, there's extra noise appearing at certain discrete frequencies. And these, two extra peaks of noise correspond uh, with a bit of uh, atomic physics to the two well-known isotopes, 
naturally occurring isotopes of rubidium, rubidium 85, rubidium 87. Okay. And you know, from these peaks alone, you can already say something about what the nuclear spins are uh, and, 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 and what the decoherence times are. Uh, again, just, 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 just through a noise spectroscopy. Now there's a couple of important checks that we really are measuring the noise signal. We're not accidentally pumping the system. One is that the signal ought to scale with the square root of the particle number, right? Noise measurement. So, so the question is about whether this is anywhere near a critical point. And the answer is no, this is a very boring sample of just uh, room temperature, very small magnetic fields, just, just, just a few gauss, it's room temperature vapor, non-interactive. So uh, we can do the measurement and we vary the atomic density of the temperature and indeed the noise signals do scale as a square root of n. So that's good, that's an important check. The second important piece was to verify that the noise signals actually increase when the cross-sectional area of the probe shrinks. Now, some people find this very obvious. I don't, uh, 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 this is a little counterintuitive, but noise signals, not in a relative sense, in an absolute sense, increase when you shrink down you know, the, 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 the size of the system that you're looking at. So some people say, well, yeah, you know, sandpaper looks rougher under a microscope. But I think you know, a slight, at least an explanation for this, which I find a little more satisfying, I don't know if you will, but uh, if, if, if you imagine we were doing a Faraday rotation experiment on some piece of magnetized glass, and there's a big magnetic field and all the moments are polarized, you have a big fat laser beam passing through the glass, we get a huge rotation, let's say a radium. Okay. Well, you know, Faraday rotation just depends on spin density. If I was looking at a million spins, and if I turned off the field and let them randomize, I'd expect fluctuations on a part of the square of a million, a part in a thousand. So milliradian fluctuations. So now if I shrunk that beam down and I was only looking at say a hundred, now I expect fluctuations of a part in the square root of a hundred is a part in 10. And then the, you know, maybe silly, but educational limit where you imagine really focusing down tightly and I'm just measuring one spin, well, fluctuations of that one spin are going to give me big plus and minus one radian uh, uh, fluctuations in the signal. So that's the sense in which um, you really win by doing noise measurements in small systems. So the fewer spins you're able to measure, spin signals really, or the noise signals really increase. Okay. Um, just one last slide on the atomic bits uh, uh, at a slightly higher magnetic field. Just wanted to show that the noise and the noise alone can reveal you know, somewhat complex magnetic ground states. So here's a rubidium and just a 40 Gauss field. So like a refrigerator magnet strength. Okay? And that single noise peak now splits into six different peaks that corresponds to spontaneous Zeeman coherences between each of the magnetic sublevels in this uh, atom. And uh, so the question is, can I connect Yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, let me paraphrase your, your question. Is there information contained in this width? Okay, yes. And in this case, for the atomic vapors, uh, uh, this width in frequency corresponds to the time it took for the atoms to diffuse across that laser beam. So this is just trivially, this width is given by a diffusion time of those atoms across the laser beam itself. That's all. Right. For this experiment, I just wanted to show that, uh, I wanna emphasize, we haven't learned anything new about rubidium that wasn't already known since the 1950s. Okay. The point of this is just to show that one can perform a full spectroscopy of the magnetic ground state. You know, get electron G factors, nuclear spins, hyperfine coupling, uh, nuclear G factors. 
just by listening very carefully without ever exciting, driving, or pumping the system. Okay, so that's sort of a main message. Um, so when, you know, besides being maybe an interesting proof of principle demo, when might a noise-based approach actually be something you want to do in your own laboratory? And you know, there's a couple of reasons I can think of. I'm sure you can think of many more. But you know, one is if you don't want to or you can't perturb your system. So maybe you're measuring a delicate quantum state, uh, like, a, like a qubit or something, and you want to perform a non-demolition or a weak measurement. Maybe your system is balanced at the edge of some phase transition. You don't want the measurement itself to force it one way or the other. Uh, or you just want to be darn sure that you're measuring the true intrinsic response in thermal equilibrium. So what about spin noise in the solid state? I'm a semiconductor physicist at heart, so I felt like an imposter doing all this uh, work on atomic systems. What about solid state? Uh, uh, well, our, our group was beaten to the punch uh, by Michael Ostreich's group in, in Hanover in, uh, uh, back in uh, 2005. Uh, their group was the first to demonstrate spin noise of electrons in a doped semiconductor. But it's essentially the same experiment. Instead of a, an, an atomic vapor cell, we now have a chunk of semiconductor that's been doped with three electrons. And you can see the fluctuations of these electrons in a frequency spectrum um, in, in, in a noise type experiment. But this really got us back in the game. And we spent a year or two uh, measuring uh, noise of three electrons in uh, semiconductors, in this case, silicon doped gallium arsenide. And I want to show this uh, slide uh, just to give you an idea of the sorts of types, the you know, size of the signals that we're dealing with. Okay, so uh, these noise signals are pretty tiny. They can be pretty tiny. So this is, again, raw data from the output of a spectrum analyzer. This is a nanoradians per root hertz. Nanoradian of rotation is not a big number. Nanoradian is the angle that would be subtended by, say, you know, a piece of your hair and viewed from a distance of, of 100 kilometers. Okay, so these are tiny, tiny angles that we're measured, measuring. But you can do that with, with optics. And then uh, you know, zero is way down here. So we have this large background noise signal. It's coming from photon shot noise. So the fact that we have to use light to do the experiment, the fact that light is really you know, particles or photons, gives us a shot noise background in all these measurements. This is known as the standard quantum limit. It's often thought of as a fundamental noise floor in optics measurements, unless you do something fancy with quantum optics, like a, a squeezing or something, which I've learned a lot about today. Now, this little tiny, okay, so you can see it's mostly flat. There's some amplifier noise. There's a couple of radio stations leaking through. This tiny little piece here, so we did the experiment under conditions where we'd see electron spin noise and conditions where we, we wouldn't. This tiny piece is the bit we're interested in. So our signal to noise, if you like, is like one to a thousand, not, not a thousand to one, but rather one over a thousand. So we're trying to tease out this little bit that just appears as a little bump above standard quantum limit. Okay. And uh, to do that, we really need to average for sometimes quite a long time. But more importantly, we want to make efficient use of the available data stream. In other words, we don't want to measure just one frequency at, at a time. We want to measure all frequencies all the time. Okay. And to do this, we learned some very important lessons from the astrophysicists who have the same problem with their radio telescopes. You know, they're pointed at the sky. You know, these folks don't want to waste time measuring one frequency at a time. So we learned a lot about digital electronics and FPGAs uh, and streamlined you know, pipeline FFTs. As the point is, at the end of the day, what we have working in our condensed matter physics lab is the back end, digital back end from a radio telescope analyzing these noise signals in a very similar way that astrophysicists do. And that's really what enables us to see these tiny signals. So if we take the difference between these two curves, uh, it, it gives very beautiful noise signals. And this is a spin noise from the free electron gas in a, a, a chunk of dope semiconductor. And again, I just want to remind you, there's a lot of information contained in these peaks. The frequency tells us something about gyromagnetic ratios and G factors. The width tells us something about dephasing time and coherence. The area under this peak tells us something about the number of electrons that are you know, fluctuating, which is not all the electrons, because now these are fermions. So it's only those with an KT of the Fermi surface that are actually participating. And um, yeah.
Tau West is spin relaxation. Long relaxation gives you narrow peaks. Well, well in, in this case, we're in the regime where you know, there's lots of processions within the spin lifetime, clearly, or else we wouldn't see a well result. So I'd be happy to talk about that more. So this would normally be the part of the talk um, where, where I would now go herring off into sort of heavy condensed matter physics and tell you how we spent 10 years studying spin noise signals from uh, semiconductor qubits, which we did do, but you know, a lot about decoherence and dephasing and coupling the nuclear spins. I don't think that would be very interesting for anyone but a you know, hardcore condensed matter physics type. And so instead of that, what I thought would be fun to share uh, are some very new results. Um, in fact, it's the first time I've ever actually spoken about this, but where we're applying these noise techniques to look at magnetic monopole noise or noise from, well, in, in artificial spin ice, okay, which are ferromagnetic structures. Now I wanna emphasize right from the beginning before the high energy physicists throw me out of the room, I'm not talking about elementary particles. I'm not talking about the elementary magnetic monopoles that you probably learned about when you were studying Jackson and anything like that. Rather, these are magnetic excitations which can appear in certain ferromagnetic systems, which behave an awful lot like elementary you know, magnetic monopoles. They move in response to applied magnetic fields the same way an electron would move in response to electric fields and they have mobility and a mass and all this stuff. Uh, but their kinetics is intimately tied to fluctuations. So we're gonna use a noise spectroscopy to learn about the kinetics of these monopole-like quasi particles. okay? So what is an artificial spin ice? Artificial spin ices are lithographically patterned arrays of nanoscale magnets. You can make them in the clean room. These are, this is uh, some pictures of uh, some, some samples. Um, each island, behaves like a single Ising-like macro spin. Okay, so the magnetization is either parallel or anti-parallel to the long axis, just due to shape anisotropy. And these islands will interact with each other just with dipolar interaction. So if you can understand refrigerator magnets, you can understand artificial spin ice because that's the only interaction. Okay, there's, there's, there's no quantum mechanics, there's no H-bar. This is just dipolar interactions between, in this case, mesoscopic magnets. Okay? Most importantly, because you make them in the clean room, you can design any sort of lattice you like. So you can make simple things like square lattices uh, or things that have uh, intrinsic frustration, like this triangular or this Kagame lattice. So in this case, each vertex has three spins. So two of them want to align head to tail like this. What's the third one want to do? Can't decide. Want to go this way or this way. So this is an example of magnetic frustration. And there's lots of interesting physics that emerges in magnetically frustrated materials, including monopoles which I'll talk about in a couple of slides, okay? Uh, the reason they're called spin ice is because when you have a frustrated system, there's sort of an infinity of possible ground states. And there's a lot, you know, extensive degeneracy and a lot of entropy even at zero temperature, which is what water ice does when it freezes. So we're gonna study the simplest possible lattice, which is just a square lattice of uh, moments. So here's just a diagram. All the physics can be understood just by considering uh, two interactions. Uh, one is the interaction between orthogonal neighbors like this. So they want to align head to tail, yeah? just like a refrigerator magnet would want to. Uh, that's J1. And then there's also a, a, what we call a J2, which is the interaction between adjacent parallel ones. And again, that would normally want to align things head to tail, except it's weaker than J1. So in fact, at zero magnetic field, uh, the ordering is like this. Now there's different. So each vertex here, there's four islands that make up each vertex. Each island can be up or down or whatever. So there's two to the fourth possible arrangements of vertices. Two of them are, uh, so these are called type one vertices here. These have two in and two out. So two in like this and two out like this. So net balance, so two north and, and two south, that's a net of zero. So if you let me use the language that has a magnetic charge, this vertex has a quote unquote charge, Magnetic charge of zero. 
And these are, in fact, at zero magnetic field, these are the lowest energy configurations. Okay, so again, if you imagine refrigerator magnets, it, this, this is how they would orient if you force them to lie on, on, on the grid. Uh, this is called a type two vertex. It also has two in it and two out, except now the two in come from one side and the two out come from the other side. This also has zero magnetic charge, but does have a polarization direction. And then these are the interesting ones. These are so-called type three vertex. And now I've got three in, one out, or three out and one in. These guys have a net magnetic charge of three minus one or minus three plus one, a net magnetic charge of plus or minus two. These are the ones that are gonna behave like magnetic monopoles and which are going to move and diffuse through the lattice and topologically protected. I'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, oh, here's, here's, here's a real picture from an experiment. Uh, this is a, a MFM or magnetic force microscopy measurement. So white and black correspond to the north and south poles. Uh, here's a in red is a type one vertex, two in, two out. Here's a type two vertex, two in, two out, but oriented that way. And, and, and here's one of these monopole vertices, with three in and one out. Okay. So what does the magnetic phase diagram of this spin ice look like? Well, you can almost intuit this. Uh, 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 what's drawn here, this, this picture is uh, supposed to represent the magnetization as a function of applied field in this y direction and this x direction. So right in the center here is zero field. And sort of obviously, if we apply a huge magnetic field along this diagonal direction, so way up here in the phase diagram, the lowest energy state, you know, all these islands are going to want to align like this, so up and to the left. Okay. Similarly, if the field was, oh, sorry, I didn't draw it, but if the, if, if the field was large and pointed down like this, this would be a state, another stable ordering. These, these would be examples of type two ordering. But as I argued at zero magnetic field, stable ordering is a, is a piling of type one vertices. So clearly something very interesting is gonna happen at some critical crossover field where we cross between this type one ordering and type two ordering. At this point, these vertices become degenerate in energy. And this is where the monopoles come in. So let's start with the type one ordering here. So every vertex here is two in, two out, no magnetic charges. Now we flip one spin. Flip this guy. That guy goes from down to up. And now what we've done is create, here's a vertex. Got three in, one out, and here's three out and one in. So this is now a monopole and it's an anti-monopole type vertex, if you let me use that language. Now we say, okay, well, let's try to get rid of this guy by flipping this spin, okay? That's fine, this, that made this one happy. This is now has zero magnetic charge, but all that really did was shift this excitation to the left. Okay, I didn't get rid of it. Similarly, as I flip more and more spins, all that does is move these monopole type vertices around and they diffuse like quasi-particles in the lattice. And the key point here is that uh, at this crossover field, this costs no energy. Type one and type two vertices have exactly the same energy. There's, there's no energy cost for having these guys to move around. So these monopoles will diffuse through the lattice uh, like real particles and they respond to magnetic fields. And to learn about their dynamics, you can listen to the fluctuations because clearly any motion is couple, you know, is necessarily involving spin flips. And that's what we are reasonably good at measuring. So to measure this, um, again, we use our uh, magneto-optical techniques broadband noise spectrometer, we measure fluctuations in time, we get the frequency spectrum in the frequency space, and here's the main result. So this is a phase diagram, this is experimental data, function of applied magnetic field, and bright colors equal lots of noise. Black colors mean no noise. So at zero field, we have a stable non-fluctuating configuration, type one ordering. At large fields, we have stable type two configurations, but at the boundary, at the borders, we have lots of noise. And this is coming about because these bright noisy regions contain a high density of mobile monopole excitations moving through the lattice. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, this experiment is only measuring fluctuations along the X direction, not X and Y direction. Yeah, thanks for asking that, that question. So the, the reason this is not uh, fourfold symmetric is because this is only fluctuations along X, not X and Y. Thank you.
the interesting physics comes about now if we are looking at the spectrum of these fluctuations as we go across these monopole regimes. So we can see that the frequency spectrum uh, actually changes quite a bit as we go from an ordered type one state to an ordered type two state. Not only does the noise get larger in amplitude, but the spectral shape changes quite a bit. This, this, this corner frequency moves to very low frequencies and the power law decay is actually changing. So that's telling us something about kinetics uh, this is just an example of one of these um, frequency spectra. Now for processes that are uncorrelated in time, so a random walk, yeah, so each step didn't depend on what happened in the past, a random walk should have a Lorentzian noise spectrum. And it should be flat and then it should decay as one over frequency squared. This doesn't, okay? So what we found is that these data are fit by some sort of modified Lorentzian, but this decay constant or, or sorry, this, this power law decay is more like one and a half, not two. And anytime you have things that aren't two, it tells you that the dynamics is correlated. There's some memory. So whether it moved left or right or jumped up or down depended on what happened in the past or if there's something in the way. We don't understand this uh, in any complete sense at all. So this is work that's currently in, in progress. Uh, but one thing that is interesting, and this is the last slide of, of the talk, I'm not sure if this will work just because of the audio, but you've probably noticed that this monopole noise occurs at frequencies that you can hear you know, with your ears. So tens of hertz to tens of kilohertz. Well, I can't hear tens of kilohertz, but you young guys probably can. Um, so just for fun, there, there, there's no physics here. But it's just kind of an interesting thing to do. You know, take these noise signals and actually you, 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 you can hear them. And this is a... a I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start here and then listen, really honestly listen to the noise as we go across this monopole regime. You'll hear essentially very nothing, sort of a crackle and things will get very loud and you can hear this corner frequency moving from high to low frequencies as we go through this monopole phase. I don't know if this is gonna work. I grew up in Honolulu. This sound brings back very powerful memories. Uh, so this is maybe what I should send to my daughter to help her to get to sleep at night. Forget the TV noise. Uh, we should really all be listening to monopole noise. So anyway, that's the end of the talk. So to summarize, if nothing else, I hope you remember uh, that you know listening to intrinsic spin fluctuations uh, can often be a very useful and a passive probe of spin dynamics. Never drive, pump, or excite or perturb the system. It's been applied to atomic, semiconductor, ferromagnetic spin systems. I'm sure there's many other systems to which it can be applied. Uh, and I think very promising outlook for noise-based probes of uh, magnetic excitations, in particular monopoles and frustrated magnets. And we're also more recently looking at natural spin ice materials as well. So with that, again, thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate your questions. I'll try to answer any further ones you have. <clears throat> Yes, I, I can. Sorry, I was getting. I'm sorry. Yes, please do. Yes. Yes. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. You do not. So I will, I, I will summarize the question. Tell me if I'm paraphrasing correctly. I, I think your point was uh, most of what I discussed was observing for long observation time. But in the limit where you look for very short observation time, say less than a ballistic time scale, uh, things will be different. Is that the question? And, and do we see that in any of our experiments? In the experiments that I've shown so far, no. We, we have not been, a, the signals are, uh, no. Uh, we're primarily concerned with getting enough signal to actually get some signal. You know, we're integrating long enough to get some signal which typically means minutes to hours. So we have never had a system that was noisy enough, so to speak, that we could do things on a short enough time scale that that sort of physics would be interesting. Um, there's, there's a longer answer, but let me tell you. After. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and we have we, we are not in that regime. We're definitely in the diffusive regime. As, as the chairman, who's in charge? Yeah. Essentially. So I did not know that even in simple mechanical systems, one could get non-Markovian dynamics. Okay, no, I look forward to hearing more about that. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that, thank you. Please light. So Marlin's comment was, what about squeeze light and could it help? Uh, absolutely. And that was one of the things I was most looking forward to visiting Texas A&M because this is a real center of excellence for all things squeeze and quantum optics, et cetera. And I learned a lot today uh, from various different people. I think we can do a better job. And uh, by using squeeze light sources, the question that I was asking some folks today is, uh, in the real materials that we study. So not atomic systems, but the solid state system, the transmission and the reflection uh, is a long way from unity. And that bites you in the backside. Um, and, and I'm not sure if squeezing would really help. Second question was what about uh, in the limit where we have uh, very close proximal atoms? Um, uh, we've never studied that. We've always looked at very diffuse uh, systems. Now, some of my theory colleagues have uh, made predictions about what, what should the noise look like in uh, BEC or BCS condensates of atoms? And there's some interesting things that emerge. I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, but certainly where these uh, interactions uh, manifest in the noise spectrum. We haven't done that. I'm, I'm not a cold atom guy, but I would love it if people would do that because I think there's potential there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so this gets back to somebody's question. Everything I'm talking about today is thermal noise, okay? Now, the dream, a dream of mine, would be to have a system where uh, the noise is coming from purely quantum effects. So we would look at the system, we'd, we'd see noise, we'd reduce the temperature, the noise would get smaller and smaller and smaller. But at some point, it would flatten out as a function of decreasing temperature. And we say, aha. This is now a system where these fluctuations are truly quantum in nature. I haven't found that system yet. Uh, uh, so we're generating these monopole pairs. No, I don't, I don't think this is a cost of transition. This is just a classical uh, 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 transition, be whoops between ordered states in, in, in the magnetic body.
Um, let, let me try to paraphrase the, the question and you tell me if I got what well, you, you, you were asking, uh, is, is there an equivalence with a susceptibility type measurement? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me try to answer the first part which is, you know, fluctuation dissipation theorem says that the AC susceptibility is related to the spectrum of fluctuations. And in systems where we can perform an AC susceptibility measurement, you drive the system and you measure you know, complex response, there's you know, very nice agreement between the noise measurement and the susceptibility measurement. So no concern in that regard. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second half of your question. Yeah. Uh, uh, Are degeneracies in, in, in important? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I probably don't understand your, the, the, the question. So let me ask you after. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I. Oh. Yeah, so, so uh, Alexei's question is, what about systems that are not in thermal equilibrium? Yes, you're absolutely right. There's all kinds of interesting uh, fluctuation dissipation like theorems that apply to out of equilibrium systems. This is something I've been working on, uh, mostly just listening to uh, my theory colleague, Nikolai Sinitsin at uh, Los Alamos, who's passionate about exactly the subject. Uh, on those rare occasions where I actually understand what he's talking about, uh, we've, we, we've done measurements with uh, driven uh, atomic systems, um, and in particular, looking at higher order correlators, which I didn't have time to talk about today, but uh, out of equilibrium noise uh, should be revealed. Sorry, I'm hoping I get to the slide I had in mind. Oh, okay. Uh, by looking at higher order correlators, so, so, so not just a two-point correlator, but actually a three or four point correlator, you can actually tell uh, more complicated things. This is just a silly example with music. Uh, but the, the, the point is uh, by looking at four point correlators, sometimes this reveals things that only appear in either truly quantum or out of equilibrium systems. So we've made some attempts, not with the piano, of course. Um, uh, it haven't been successful yet, but we, we, we have an idea that we're gonna try later this year about that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.